right? What are the biggest I mean, fuck-ups that you see people make? Ah, ah, ah. Biggest fuck-ups would be... Rich, my man, I have heard so many great things. I've been so looking forward to this. Some of the references gave me things that we could talk about in the show. Some we've just bonded about instead. But thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here, Harry. Thanks so much for having me. Not at all. The pleasure is mine. But I want to start with a little bit on you, because you've worked in some of the most incredible orgs in, in the last kind of 10 years of business building, really. And so I want to start with how did you make your way into the world of tech and sales first? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. First, first of all, it's uh, it's uh, there's a lot of luck involved. I think it's a lot easier to see things going back than looking forward. Um, but I, I started my career as a as an engineer, biomedical engineer. My parents are both engineers, were immigrants, and so that idea of get a technical degree, get a technical background, and then you know you'll always have work to do was a little bit of what I grew up with. But after finishing, I realized, oh wow, I watch the movies, I, I see TV, and I really wanted to be some kind of a business executive someday. I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, this was during the uh, dot-com bubble burst. So there weren't a lot of jobs out there. And I was reading and doing my research and go, huh, you know, it looks like a lot of these uh, these uh, business leaders, these CEOs, they, they seem to have this like sales background. That's interesting. Maybe I should try that. And, uh, and you know, if I, if it, if I don't, can't do it well if I suck at it. You know, I'll go back and take one of these engineering offers I, uh, that, that I had walked away from. And so my first job was, I was I think the base salary was like twenty thousand dollars. And so it was like, well, if I can't make a good commission, I won't pay my rent anyway. So why don't we give this thing a shot for a year? And that was really it, right? I went into an investment company called Fisher Investments, that was really transformational at the time. Really trying to get people from all money management being distributed through your financial advisor or brokerage house to, oh, we're going to build this direct to consumer money management shop through what was junk mail, hold calling, and later, you know, internet advertising, search advertising, and uh, to sell high net worth asset management into institutions. And so it sounded like kooky, right? I've got this image in my head of the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, when they're starting <laughs> that, like garage and they're like cold calling for yeah. penny stocks. Uh, it, it was not quite Wolf of Wall Street, right? It was perfectly legitimate. The company's now like two, three hundred billion in assets under management, like five thousand employees. Uh, we were probably like three hundred employees at the time, like really trying to to get this like direct mail, direct thing to work. And uh, and I was an SDR. I was going out there cold calling wealthy people that we got to fill out junk mail reply cards for like a little flashlight or a little booklet. Or call a one eight hundred number, and that was really uh, that was really it. And then doing a bunch of outbounding to cold pr cold prospects to try to build this. That is fucking funny. I wanna I wanna pick on a couple of areas of your career because, as we said, yes. some incredible organizations. And we're gonna do like a quick fire at the beginning uh, to yes. get to know each other. This is why I'm single because I actually do this on dates too. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna start with Meta, okay? What was your yes. biggest lesson from your time with Meta, and how did it impact your operating mindset? So I, I convinced myself I, I got a I got a job there by by whittling my way into Cheryl and down to David and, and get Grady uh, to do basically strategy and ops work like this big segmentation and tiering project. And I was coming from outside the industry, never done it before. But, you know, I pitched pitched that because I did a lot of that work in my prior company. One of the things I learned most about that company, and I know that, that sometimes it's derided is move fast and break things like the idea that you don't have to be perfect but sometimes especially in a fast changing market speed is at a 10x premium um that was a lesson that was that was huge for me because i came out of this investment shop high focus on compliance and regulatory and don't break the law do things perfectly right following this process into an organization where even at the time i joined it was over a thousand people so i don't know a thousand two thousand people going like, hey, everyone just try to do the right thing, experiment, move fast, break things, and maybe a few of these will work, and then we'll start doing more of that. And to me, that was mind-blowing. But I think that really balanced out a lot of how I think about scaling now, which is there are times when you want to really strive for, we got to do things right. We got one cut at this thing. It's a glass ball. It's not a rubber ball. If we drop it, it's going to shatter. Um, to, okay, how many things are actually that, that if we screw it up, if we fuck it up, we can't go back and try to fix it? It's actually fewer than we think. And so 
especially when scaling, because I'm of the, uh, I, I, I know I'm not the smartest person in the room. If I don't have like the best answer with all the data that's going to be right, why not have like five more shots on goal instead of like, you know, waiting for that perfect shot? And I think that was actually a huge learning I had that even at a much larger scale than many startups, and I know that they don't often think like that now because it's a massive corporation, um, moving fast, trying a lot of things and, you know, and really embracing that okay to fail mindset is huge. How do you create urgency in a sales cycle in terms of moving fast? Sales cycles are actually slowing now. How do you create yeah. urgency in a sales cycle? Yeah, I was just on a call with uh, a number of other COO, CRO business leaders thinking like everybody's sales cycle slowing. Everybody's seeing, uh, you know, harder to get the deal, no budgets, fill in the blank. Like, you know, having sold travel during a pandemic at Navan trip actions, all of a sudden this sale that, hey, we got the next Netflix for travel. It's awesome. Check it out. You'll love it. Um, that early adopter, that product led sale um, does not work in a, in a tight market. And that's not a bad thing. It does weed out the, the people who are disciplined and actually build a story versus not. But in a market like this, um, a couple things need to happen, right? The default is I'm talking to my CFO. I'm talking to my CEO. I'm not spending any money. Default is no. Don't even spend the time. Don't even open the door. The only time that I'm going to spend something is if someone convinces me, ooh, this thing is not what you think it is. It actually is going to solve the most important thing that you're afraid of right now. Efficiency, sales productivity, um, support, utilization, whatever those things are for me as a, as a, as a, as a business owner. Um, unless you can speak to me in a very clear and concise way about what, why what you do solves that in a quantifiable way for the thing that I'm afraid of most right now, I'm getting nothing done. Now, the flip side of that is if I get to the person who actually owns that budget and owns that, uh, that decision and owns that business, right, and can speak to that with that quantifiable thing, then guess what? I can break through that. I can get my sale done, even in a world where procurement's the enemy, ops is the enemy. Everybody who's not an executive has heard save money, save money, save money, which means don't spend money on anything. Um, we just had you know, a, a large deal with a uh, AMLA 100 firm uh, that we closed. And right now, they're all looking to save money right now. You know, it's, it's tight times. And the sales rep um, and sales leaders got to the economic buyer and the CF. And it wasn't just one. It was like a CFO, the managing partner of the firm. And they'd been a customer. This was a large expand um, for years. And yet the, they were not thinking about us as anything more than an awesome technology that applies AI and machine learning to help them do discovery better and shrink the haystack of evidence. But instead, that person heard, ooh, wait a second. If I'm able to do this more effectively, I'm turning a cost center into a profit center. Wow, I can retain my employees better. Wow, I can pitch for business better in a more differentiated way. In a down market, that is a strategic business lever for me, not a capability that just helps me do something that I normally do. And that partner said, wow, I don't know how I wasn't leaning into this six years ago when we first started using you, but this is actually something we need to build our business on. When you think about sales teams, sales reps, sales leaders, early stage CEOs leading and sales teams listening to this show, how does their approach need to change in a world where buying power centralizes back to CFOs? I think particularly in an environment now, and I, I think there's also an overdoing of like the CFO running the company isn't always a healthy thing, right? We see the Apple example of like, okay, maybe it's not crazy. But for most startups, you, you, you don't want to just make your investment decisions based off of like pure economic and cost control. You got to make some strategic decisions as a founder, as a CEO. Uh, I would trust my CFO as a partner to help me think through, hey, are, is the overall business I'm running sort of in the envelope, right? Depending on what growth I think I can get and what costs I need to go get to realize that and how am I doing on my magic number, my cost of acquisition, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think about it a little different as like a, C, a founder versus like if I'm selling to that CFO. If I'm a founder, I, I'm probably pulling my CFO closer and saying, hey, I, I want to I run a high growth business. I want it to look like this. I want to invest in these things. I want to make strategic bets and work with my CFO if that person's capable to really get down to a little bit more detail about it. But we're doing pre-CFO. We don't have okay. a... We're, 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 finance we're, person. 
You're 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 in, you're, you're in too big company, baby. We are early, <laughs> you, you big players. You got too much cash. We're yeah. through that. Okay, so yeah. I'm going. Before we used to rock up, show you the product, and you go, "Ooh, shiny!" And yeah. now it's like sell to our CFO, sell to procurement. What does that yeah. mean? We need to change doc wise, team structure wise. Ah, should okay. should we I'm not selling. invest in product or yeah. growth? Should we invest in yeah. enterprise sales? If I'm a founder, and, and that's the environment I'm in right now, and, and I advise and invest in a number of companies who are, are going through this exact same thing right now, right? The sale is real different for sales automation or you know whatever the technology is just six or 12 months ago. Um, right now, I'm not necessarily saying it's it's a person, but what I need to figure out in the jobs to be done model is like, I need to figure out what is the problem my product solves and for whom, right? But getting back to that exact, okay, what is the problem I solve and for whom and how do I quantify that thing? And how do I make sure that that problem I solve is actually something that the CFO, the CEO, the COO actually cares about right now, Right. Cutting costs, running an efficient business, sales productivity, you know, margin. I need to be able to make sure I can map back my narrative of what my product does to that big thing. And unless I can do that, I'm not going to get in the room. That can be a you need a big bad enterprise sales leader to do it. You could be you need some marketer to do it. But fundamentally, it could be sitting down with your advisors or your investors to say, hey, how do I map that back right now? So I'm sitting with Jonathan Friedman at DemoStack a couple of weeks ago. And he's like, hey, we're, we're, we're trying to work on this thing. Great. OK, you have a tool that helps people create demos or you have a scratch pad that helps people shrink down the size of you know time spent. Um, right now, without any other information, my CFO is going to be, oh, it's just some other piece of stack that the sales team wants to buy to make their jobs a little easier. Don't do it. Use the tools you have already. Do it in GDOS. Whatever the case is, use your CRM. I just need to figure out how I can map that story back to what does that CFO care about? Operating more efficiently, um, sales productivity. If I actually invest in this thing, it's going to make my sales team that much more productive in a proven out way with these data points and with these sound bites. That is not a need a big bad person to do it. It is sitting down with people who've done it, with people who sold in that. It could be your top sales rep. It could be your advisors and investors to map out that story track and then put it in a fancy deck or whatever you want or talk track for your sales team or prospecting less messages, right? What what else are you seeing with the CRO, COO discussions that you're having? Are you seeing a complete pullback in marketing? What, what other trends are you seeing in this new market? I'm fascinated. Yeah, I, I think right now, um, every founder, every board member, every CFO is is being pushed to say, okay, in this shift from grow to shift to productive growth, what is the operating envelope that we can play in right now, right? I think we're looking, you know, right now, sales leaders, COOs, CBOs, whatever the, you know, president, whatever the title is of the person that runs a go-to-market um, is being asked to say, hey, how do you demonstrate that you are building a effective and productive go to market on a per rep basis on a per seat basis whether it's my support org my cs org my aes my sdrs my partner people i'm trying to figure out what is how do i actually measure the effectiveness and productivity of that org bookings per head rep ops per rep source dollars per marketing spend if i can start to normalize those investments to metrics that actually matter and i can start comparing to each other then i can start making the trade offs of wow is my cost per new booking customer or new booking dollar, is that actually better or worse with an SDR lead or a marketing inbound or an AE outbound if I say they're going to spend a quarter of their time doing pipeline generation? That's the kind of effort that I think, even with you don't need some you know crazy expensive analyst to do that, to just start having that conversation and actually making those trade-offs, even if you're a startup, uh, to a late stage private company, to a public company, that version of that conversation needs to happen. And then we can decide for ourselves, how do we make some decisions about where we want to invest and don't want to invest in the spirit of what's going to drive efficient growth and productive growth? Uh, how are you finding renewals? I had Henry Schuck at um, Zoom Info on the show, and he said yep. they're actually having to change that org structure because of the challenge of renewals being so much harder. And so they're actually placing a lot more people in data and data kind of enforcement, proving yeah. out that it's a really efficient tool to use within organizations before everyone just upsold anyway. How are you yeah. seeing renewals and what's the impact there? Yeah. So so a couple of things I'll caveat that at Everlaw, we you know, we sell to 
the government, we sell to you know, the DOJ, for example, right? We sell to law firms, we sell to corporate legal teams, GCs. So it's different for different folks. Right now, though, the default is the same thing that happens on the pre-sale side is happening on the post-sale side, right? How am I rationalizing the use of this tool or the tool to this degree? What am I actually getting out of it? Can we clean out a bunch of this SaaS proliferation across the company? That is coming across pre and post sale. And so the impact on renewals for uh, the success org is we need to have a pure, like true business justification if we're going to keep expect that customer to stay with us. So think about it as the converse or the, the mirror image of what needs to happen on the sales side and why the sales and success side needs to be tightly intertwined. If a lot of these deals, think about how we were doing deals like early days of Trip Actions Devon or early days of Everlaw. Awesome product. It's great. You sold to early days of MuleSoft, right? Sold to a developer who's using it for a project. CFO, CIO doesn't care about that, right? They want to centralize on a tool. They don't see it's valuable. Like they don't care who bought it and what lower level, mid level person bought it. So, how do you do that in the post sale if a lot of your customer base didn't buy that way? That means, ooh, we got to go figure out how to actually build that from the ground up, the bottom up. Oh, let's take out, let's let's actually have a conversation about what is ROI? How do you measure it? What are the metrics that you think you should use that we think you should use? And let's agree on what that looks like. Let's actually set the tone of what good looks like within that. Let's make sure your CFO or CIO or whoever is going to ultimately say yes or no is bought into that as well. And so we almost have to like redo the sale the right way with the value message, with the EB engagement than when we hadn't done it in the front which is tougher, right? Are you using an account manager to do it? Are you using CSM to do it? Are you using AE horsepower to do it? And then on this pure CS side, even if the profile of our CS rep is make them super successful, help support them, get them launched and implement and service the admin, the question is, oh, how do we arm that profile of person with enough commercial mindset and, um, and tooling and playbooking to say, oh, how do I help map the org? How do I help ask tactical questions to figure out what our adoption is or is it? How do I get some preview into other parts of the org that can be using us or that can utilize different parts of the stack? Like give them some of those plays that they can start to see that and actually build it from the existing potentially tactical relationship out. So I think it's a two-pronged thing, but either way, without trying tying clearly to value, uh, quantifiable value and agreement of what that value is, um, um, that relationship is going to be at risk right now. Speaking of kind of that tactical roadmap within orgs, I think kind of we've jumped a step here, uh, which is yeah. my fault. But if we kind of go back to the question of like sales playbook, who is the person to create the sales playbook? Is it the founder or is it the first head of sales or the first sales rep? <laughs> Mil- million dollar question. I was talking to a startup founder uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and she said, you know, I'm hearing mixed messages, Rich. Help me understand. Some of my investors are telling me, like, hire a head of sales, VP sales, CRO, whatever it is, hire that person ASAP, get out of the picture. You're a product founder, get out of the picture. Like, you're, you're going to fuck yourselves over by being, you know, being involved. And then another board member saying, you're the founder, it's early, you got to be in it, like, you got to own it. It's like completely opposite. How do I make that out? Same, same founder, and she's like, help me out. So I said, hey, there's a reason why you hear different things. And and oftentimes, I think Gokul Rodram just put a post on this, like hire the right person for the, the time that you actually, or for what you actually need done, not the super late stage person for the early stage person and vice versa. But I would say for the for that particular founder and for that early stage founder, if you're sort of at that stage where you're still figuring out like that question of what is the problem my product solves and for whom, right? What industry, what use case, what profile of person, uh, what region, if I'm still at that pl- place where I feel like that's not a really repeatable motion and able to do at scale, if I'm a product founder, I got to be close enough to help make sure that whatever is happening and whatever learnings we're getting is translating back so that that product-led version of of sort of that product market or product customer uh, fit is lights out and tight, at least at, at the tightest ICP before you scale it out. If you're trying to go bring in a head of sales to outsource that for you at that stage, that's pretty dangerous, right? Ariel at Navan was really involved with a lot of the earliest deals and knew the product, knew the people really well to the point where he got a really clear view of, ooh, this is our problem we solve for whom this is 
how we'll talk about it, all right? And then at that stage, hey, Rich is coming in, or actually there was a CRO before before me, uh, is coming in to help that person to do the job. But let's let's say the CRO is coming in to actually help to scale that motion out. Now, if you have an early stage salesperson, maybe it's an IC, maybe it's a team lead, maybe it's a player coach, you got to be really close to that person to make sure those learnings are coming back because that's what you need to happen. The learnings are going back to help shape that product market, product customer fit. As you feel more confident that is that is there, then you can step further away from that and outsource it to someone who can tell that story to that ICP in the way that you would and then build a team around it that's going to do that. Dude, if you don't know the problem, who you sell to and how you sell it to them, you shouldn't be doing this fucking company. I mean, because no, no. you, you'll have zero luck fundraising, by the way, if you can't do that. You'll have well, zero well, ability to hire the right people if you can't do that because you've got no idea what you're looking so what, for. What am I inspiring them about? What's the story, right? And I met a lot of founders out there that they might have a big vision of the problem they want to solve and then it gets really murky after that. I don't want to go work with that founder unless they, we've actually done a little bit of legwork to show there's some... MVP of a go to market of a something that works there. And frankly, I've also worked with founders who you said you can't raise money in the previous funding environment. I worked with, I've, I've talked to and have friends who are founders that actually did raise money. And guess what? They had sort of a murky version of that, that maybe they might've had some initial product market or product customer, some problem they were solving for some people, but maybe it wasn't big enough or maybe it wasn't meaningful enough. Maybe it wasn't going to catch in any market. And guess what? They start scaling a team around it and then six, 12, 24 months later, they're going, oh, we're not in the right business. We're not in the right thing. I can't go back now because I've already committed to this path. What do you do then, right? Give the money back to the investors, hold up shop, pivot. Give the money back. Give the money back. Give the money money back. back. Uh, The question I have for you is, okay, so we both agree that it should actually be the founder building out that playbook. So uh, then they kind of hire against it. Should they be hiring a sales rep? to jack of all trades, dog test it, really just execute on that playbook? Or should they hire a head of sales to build out a team beneath them? Head of sales has a lot of, can mean a lot of things in, in software and SaaS. It could be a person running a, you know, 500,000 person org. It could be someone who has a CRO title or president title that has no direct reports. So we'll, we'll, we'll use the version of it that we'll define as like, depends on what role, right? I think the, throw the title out the window for a moment. I think that first hire, when I'm looking to scale, I'm looking to scale me out as a founder. I'm trying to figure out how do I get someone who can continue to help me shape this message because it's not all done yet, right? We I speak, speak about it sometimes like it's binary. It's not. Uh, to help scale and continue to refine the go-to-market um, and can give me some scale so that I'm not doing all the sales, so that I have someone who's close enough to me that's giving the feedback back so that we can iterate on that story, on the, the, the ICP, on the on the product market fit, yet it's helping me do more of those sales. To me, that could be a player coach. Um, It could be a player who's stretching into a player coach. It could be someone who has that sort of creativity, but also can get out in front of the customers and help me continue to hone that message. The next role would be the person who can probably run that first line team and continue to help shape that narrative, but also manage a few people to do that, right? And again, where you are in that spectrum of you're hiring that first player to help you or that first player coach to help you probably depends on how much conviction you have that what you have is ready for that, right? If I jump in ahead from that first player coach or person to go do it with me to the first person who's like more of a coach than a player and going to have a team of people doing it, I probably have to be comfortable putting those that amount of chips on the table. I don't gamble, but like, you know, I've been to Vegas. I'm going to put five chips on the table instead of one. I got to have enough conviction that I have enough to go build those five reps around that's going to give me the momentum to go learn it faster or deliver bookings against it the transition away from founder-led sales is i think the hardest thing in in startups in many ways oh my god Uh, so you do it too slow or you do it too fast what are the biggest fuck-ups that you see people make ah, ah, ah. biggest fuck-ups would be one is staying too close right i speak sometimes with founders who have like 10 sales reps reporting directly to them that is like that makes no sense five sales reps reporting directly Makes no sense. It completely impedes. And then you also build this like sales model where like you are de facto head of sales or head of revenue and, and you're doing you're starting to play in territory that you might not be good at in terms of coaching and developing and, and holding accountability, metrics, comp plans, all that stuff. Uh, so so I think that to me is a hey, you maybe moved a little quickly against it, or sorry, too too slowly against it. Too quickly would be in a couple flavors. One is you 
hire someone who's like really large scale that has aspirations to be an early startup, thinks it's cool to be in an early startup, maybe was in an early startup 10 years ago or 20 years ago as your first person. And you know, again, Gokul's post on LinkedIn, you should check it out, like talks about it's like they don't really know what to do or they can't do it without hiring a bunch of other people to do it. That's a telltale sign of like, okay, this person's too far or has been too far from it for too long and either isn't willing or able to go step back and get their hands dirty to the degree I need done. Hey, build a comp plan from scratch. Build me a sales plan from scratch. I don't have an FP&A team or CFO. I got Google Docs and like, let's go figure out, you know, what you're going to take against this. Let's build a, a straight up simple comp plan for your reps. Like be able to play there and wants to play there and can readily play there. Dude, That's should we, really with, cool. with the rep, should we hire two at a time? Jason Lampkin's like, hire two at a time. You'll see who's good. Do we do that or do we hire one? Yeah, or? I'm a big fan of two at a time, right? Again, this is the engineer me coming out. My wife can't stand it and the towel's got to be perfect and stuff. The two at a time thing, right? So much goodness comes out of it. First of all, if you don't have enough conviction in your business that you're hiring a rep to go hire two, get there. Like get it to the point where you think you have enough for, for two versus one because ultimately you're splitting hairs if you're like, oh, well, I, have, I think I can support one rep, not two. Fundraise, get more conviction, the product, the story, whatever. But the two point is just so valuable because cohorting in terms of ramping, the, the supporting each other, the ramping, the competitive elements of it, it's really hard to know. Is my product market fit fundamentally wrong? Is the way I'm telling the story fundamentally wrong? Is the, you know, is the PG messaging I'm using fundamentally wrong? Or is it the rep that sucks or the rep that can figure it out? Having two helps to at least give you the minimum viable, like separate the two and give you a little bit of signal about what's happening, right? Now, again, if you hire two great reps, awesome. You have two bad reps, like, you know, maybe you got to press restart and and uh, and do it again. But at least it helps to neutralize for that. Do you know what I see as a massive mistake? I see as a massive mistake people doing PLG and enterprise at the Ooh. same time. They're almost too nervous to do one and commit and burn the boats on PLG or just be a top down enterprise org. For me, yeah. I think that's a big mistake. I might be totally wrong because I'm a VC. It's my prerogative to have opinions and be wrong. You're the CRO who knows. Can, when, when doing PLG and enterprise, can you do both at the same time? And what are the thoughts here? I, I would say it's, it's, and again, operational definition, enterprise can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It can be any company that's not an SMB. It can be large enterprises like, you know, Coke or Pepsi or, or, or uh, sorry, Coke or Walmart or Nike. Um, for operational definitional purposes, let's let's say enterprise meaning uh, the you know few couple hundred thousand, few hundred thousand dollar sales rep in a long protracted you know six to twelve month sales cycle, uh, and PLG will call sort of pure sort of online self sell self serve, and then there's probably something in the middle of it which is like a velocity sales assist or sort of inside or sort of inside outside hybrid model. So again, spectrum, right? I want to make sure we don't fall into the camp of everything is binary. Um, but I would say at a high level, um, I agree that it's really hard to do both well, right? And it comes back to even how you design your product. So for example, Mule, Facebook, Meta, Facebook ads is inherently a self-serve platform, right? Built self-serve first. You can use it self-serve. You can now self-onboard. Everything is built such that you can do it without any hands hold, hand-holding. And so the way that you build the, the the people org around that naturally is, okay, well, let's make sure we can get everybody self-serving and then using that as your funnel to figure out, oh, who are the, the bigger spenders, who has higher potential spend, who's doing interesting things that we can then build back into the product. And then how can we use humans to augment the effectiveness those people are having to go extend them out? And that was what Facebook's mid-market org did and had actually a lot of the largest accounts in the earlier days, Zynga, Playdom, Living Social, right, Groupon, the performance advertisers. Because they weren't out there selling Nike and Walmart and crushing that yet. They were helping the early advertisers find a lot of success doing that. That's a fundamentally different motion than let's go take someone to a Super Bowl game. Let's go build this great IO. Let's go create, create this great creative pitch with the, the creative agencies to sell in. So that's just one example. But you build a product inherently differently and to start to say like, ooh, we're going to do that well and have a really enterprise ready product is really, really hard. Mulesoft's on the other side of that, right? Heavy, large enterprise integration APIs work inherently better for larger companies that have a bigger need than sort of small startups. When you think about sort of enterprise corporate IT, 
for a company that has not built a product that is meant to solve for like anybody can come and use it like Zapier, you know, type of citizen integrator um, to sort of say, oh, let's all of a sudden think with a different DNA, think with a different go to market motion, think with a different marketing motion. You're not doing multi-touch attribution, lead gen marketing, right? You're doing consumer marketing. That's just such a different muscle from a product engineering, go to market marketing success standpoint that to do both well, you really have to have enough commitment and then DNA on the team and then resourcing to say, we're going to do it well enough to actually win in both. What I see too often is people say, we're going to do one and they don't really resource it. It's one thing to say you're going to do it. It's another to actually do it effectively. And they don't truly understand oftentimes because they don't even have the DNA or experience on the team who's built it to understand how different and hard it is. So I'm a huge believer in you, you got to commit to at least one and it's okay to evolve to the other, which is uh, what going mainstream often means, but but don't try to be too, too early. Okay. So a quick one before we talk about hiring, which I can't wait for, which one's easier to start in? It's a good question. As, as a go to market leader, I'm, I'm a bit of a, an orthodox person who's done consumer B2B, B2B to C, large enterprise, velocity, PLG, uh, so I've seen a lot of different businesses through a lot of different stages with different motions and, and different sort of spaces. The intellectual uh, answer would be it depends on which one, which space you're in and what your DNA is, right? If I'm a large enterprise seller to come out or a large enterprise sales leader to come out and say, hey, now we'll do a velocity motion, that shit's hard, right? Because you, you, know, you don't have a lot to go off of. If I'm an SMB velocity sales leader that runs 300 person inside sales teams to now try to figure out an enterprise sales motion like that might be hard for other reasons so i think a lot of it depends on what space you're in and, and which business you should build like if i'm building a, a security company doing enterprise security i should probably start at the top of the market and then go down because that's where the inherent need is biggest and if i'm building you know like an ads business right it's an online ads business publisher like facebook going bottoms up was absolutely right so if I'm a trip actions, a B2B to C, that's done sort of a mid-market down and then mid-market up, like that was interesting because they started where there was a really strong opportunity to make impact at the intersection of sort of the size, who can pay the most, where that problem was the biggest of like having this inefficient travel platform uh, that wasn't user centric, that wasn't, didn't look nice, uh, but didn't necessarily need to have the enterprise features that, you know, the, the largest companies in the world at the time needed. So I would say a lot of it is depending on what space you're going after. If you're going to ask me personally what I think is easier, personally, I think it's easier to start small and go up. I agree totally. I also think it's because it's the product and growth mindset that's inherent within a PLG-led org where it's product first. Yeah. And it's so difficult to imbue that in an enterprise org. Oh, and actually tacking on enterprise sales into a PLG motion, not as hard as one thinks. You get a Maggie hold of the world, she can do yeah. that very well. Yeah, Maggie helped do that in the early days of, of Slack, right? And that PLG sort of build up with the AJ Tanning, who's awesome. We worked together at Meta. But but being able to build that out isn't as crazy, but just don't try to jump too far ahead of where the product is ready, where your success org is ready to support, where your services org is ready. That motion, if done right, I think can be super effective. Dude, we're going to hire some people now, Okay. I got no freaking idea how to hire them. I'm a young first time founder and you're, ah, you're my advisor. So we're hiring our sales, first sales team members. How yeah. do I literally structure the hiring process? How many meetings? What are we doing? The first, the second, is there a third? Help me. So often I hear from founders like my VC, my advisor, somebody recommended this person. So like, I guess I'll hire him. Right. Or Somebody tells me, go hire the person that came out of XYZ company that is in my space. Great. I got to go hire them more. Go hire the most senior person. So many of those things are out there. I, I take a lot of my hiring philosophy from uh, MuleSoft of all places. My wife is a longtime Googler and was famous for doing the, you know, their executive committee has to approve every hire. You know, Facebook had, had a pretty you know, rigorous and healthy hiring process. MuleSoft turned that to another level and it really taught me how to, to think about hiring the right way. And that and Jeff Stump from Andreessen actually has a great, great sort of framework for this around sort of like what is exactly the jobs we've done and how do you break that back into what, what, what skills you need and then how do you bet for those skills? 
the simple thing that I that I would say from my my, my mule stop days and Greg Shot, if you're ever listening, like thank you for the religion on this. People are the most. It's an adage. It's oversaid. It's a cliche. People are the most important thing. Like that was what that company did better than anything else was figuring out like not the product, not anything else, but hiring the best people and then figuring out how to utilize them. And how to do that is number one is like, what do you actually need to do in this job? Like not just make calls or all that, but what are the like outcomes that you want this job to have? Help me figure out the narrative. Help me, you know, break into new customers in a evangelical sale versus a sort of a, a more tactical, we already know how we're going to sell it sale. Like, is it a, you know, product sale or I need someone to go spice someone up and get them to believe in the world's round when everybody thinks it's flat. Like, what are those things you actually need done? And then let's actually break that down into skills that support it. And then let's actually break down a process that helps us vet for those skills in an effective way. And interviews, by the way, are like the most, if you think about it, they're actually a pretty ineffective way to understand if someone's going to be good at something, right? Whoever interviews well gets a job, but that doesn't mean they're a great engineer and they're a great uh, CSM or they're a great marketer. They they interview really well. They're great in the room. And I'm terrible in the room, so that's why I say that. But anyway, that's aside. What I need to do is design a process that vets for that. So say I decide, okay, for my enterprise AEs, I need really strong operational linear execution. I need strong coachability. I need great in the room skills. Let's actually vet for that designing, number one, structured interview questions that vet for, ooh, tell me how you had driven situation action result, right? Tell me how you drew this type of interaction, what you did, what was the result, how did you do it? Having those structured questions that vet for those specific skills, and then knowing what a good answer looks like, what a bad answer looks like, and then making sure to ask that question at every time, and ideally with the same interviewer, so that you can get some calibration between candidates. That's really important. So if you build out a light structured interview process, say it's, I don't know, three interviewers, one for track record of achievement, one for you know, this linear execution, coachability, one for... What is what happens in your coach when they see Like track record, I get it. I go through meals, yeah. off, so I go through mess, or I go through trip actions. Yeah. yeah. What happens in coachability? Yeah, how do you actually vet for that, right? So again, I'll, I'll go to the other pieces, but track record, and by the way, a lot of people screw that. Like a lot of people leave a lot on the table for that. Hey, how'd you do? Oh, I was a top rep. I was this, that, that. And they stop there because oftentimes you, everybody, every salesperson can tell you how they were the top. And then the questions that don't get asked are like, oh, what were the metrics that you were measured on? Okay. How did you do on that? Great. How many other reps were there in that, that, that cohort in that region? I was the top of my region. I was the top 5%. Oh, it was the top of two reps. Cool. All right. That doesn't tell me much, right? I was the top one of 10 reps on new business sales and the average attainment I did was 120 and the average attainment they did was 80. Oh, that's actually valuable, right? Asking those clarifying questions over what period, what was the metric, how were you measured, how many people were in that cohort, how well do the others do? So you can actually get a real sense of like repeatability quarter after quarter after quarter, year after year after year, roll after roll after roll. That's actually really important so that we don't stop at, hey, I was a top achiever. Cool. Done. That doesn't give you much. Any great salesperson can never be up past that. Coachability, right? EQ, those are like hard to ask. How do you do that? Tell me about a situation where you were stuck in a deal. Why were you stuck? What happened? What'd you do next? Who was that? What'd you do to get help? Well, what, what did, how did you react to this? Don't lead them. To, what'd you do to get help? Oh, help. Uh, I went to tones and stuff. What'd you do in that situation? Did they engage their manager? Did they engage an SA? Did they go talk to partners outside to go figure out how to go crack that open? Okay, then what happened? Then what happened? Then what happened? And you can design these questions to start talking about, okay, what is it, you know, in a real life situation, in my role, what would I want them to do in that scenario, right? To see if they're coached. You know, the classic one is like, hey, what's, um, you lost a deal. What happened? I'm looking for humility. Oh, you know, all these other things happen, you know, it wasn't built right and externalization, externalization, externalization. Or I really should have seen this. I didn't do that. I learned that, you know, I should have gotten to the EV earlier. Okay, how how'd you not go to the EB earlier? Well, I thought I had a great champion that were going to get the deal done. Oh, interesting. Um, and what did you do in your next, you know, had what did you do with that in your next deal? Did you do anything with that? Oh, well, you know, I, I started getting to the EB or you know what? That was a one-off. That was a one-off, Harry. It was going to happen, you know. You can't, you can't prevent those from happening sometimes. Yeah, that's a very different response. And oh, I started to do things differently. I go work with my manager earlier to look at the deals and the deal reviews. 
I'm actually going to use these lines to go get to the EB earlier, and this is why. So uh, you can actually, without leading, see how they respond. And when you ask them, then what, then what, then what, tell me more, tell me more, you can get some more color around that. What are big red flags in what you just said? So like one for me would be like, oh, it was Rich's fault. It was Rich's fault. And you just have total uh, denunciation of blame. When you look yeah. across career track record, like track record and coachability, any things where you're like, Harry, when they say that, be worried. You know, when I hear things like success was all me and not sharing with with my SA helped me crush it. My CSM was really helping. My manager was really helping my SDR versus like, you know, I, I did this, I did that, I did that, and that's it. And then if it's like something didn't go right, oh, you know, we had a real deal um, that pushed this quarter. It was with a, a large um, Fortune Fortune 100. And, um, you know, they had a big data breach and, you know, this happened. But you know what? I really should have planned around that. I really should have made sure that we had more people in this org or that org engaged. I think that trend comes out when you think about who owns success and who owns failure and what you do with that. Like Those are some of the things that become red flags or not and how they handle it. And frankly, when people talk about, for example, you know, job changes, a lot of job changing, huge red flag for me. At some point, everybody's got a good reason. But if you say do one or two year stints for like several in a row, that's a huge red flag. You know, performance, when they can't tell me exactly, great sales reps know exactly how they did every year. Like I can tell you, okay, in, in this year, in 2007, I did this and I made this amount of money. Hmm. I was number one on the sales board. I was number two on the sales board in 03. John Holwick beat me. Damn him. He's an awesome dude. But ah, I missed out because of X. Like salespeople know their numbers. If they can't like quickly rattle and tell you those things or they start to hem and haw, that's an interesting signal when you start digging into track record. But again, the interview structured interviews is only half the story and don't actually give you much. Having an exercise that really, and you don't have to be a big company to do this. What is something that they would actually do that mimics what they would need to do in the role? right? Hey, here's a scenario. Make a cold call to me. Write, write a prospecting email. Run this meeting, but do a prep to say what we're going to talk about, like how you would set up a meeting and then go run that meeting with me and how you pitch maybe our product, maybe it's your own product and do that mock version of it. Super helpful and actually rate that. How did they show up in the room? How did they do at setting the, uh, setting the tone for the meeting and running it well? How do they do at, at doing discovery? How do they do at actually, um, commercial teaching, how do they do at closing for next steps? Like, how do I make sure that I can quickly design that simple extras to see how they're doing at that? Um, and it can be two parts, but it should be part of the process. I have to ask, do you do it on your company? And so you have the domain knowledge that you can judge and value them against? Or do you yeah. do it on their company where they're operating from a, a situation of yeah. safety and domain experience? Yeah, I, I've done both. Obviously, with your company, you can see if they can quickly do the research, assimilate all the information they get with how to pitch it, figure out the product and pitch it back to you. If you do their product, you can demonstrate more about how they would run the meeting, how they would do the discovery, how they would um, how they would sort of practice these core sales skills. So it really depends on what you would want to get out of it more. And actually, I might do either one depending on, you know, do I have do I have questions of if this person's either smart enough to do my sale or motivated enough to go do the research or is putting together the pieces or can actually help tell my story in a way that's better that I haven't thought about yet? If it's like a new product, like can they give me some ideas? If I have questions on like core salesmanship or salespersonship, um, I might have them do theirs and, and I can sort of play, you know, play into their role. Or I might do a little bit of both. We're going to spend 15 minutes on a meeting here and then we're going to do like a quick five minute like if you're prospecting and doing PG, how would you help PG me uh, to take a meeting and go do you know our product, right? Um, but that exercise is super important. And then finally, like references and back channels. Um, I know sometimes people do, you know, the back channel thing is some you know has has its 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 mixed mixed emotions out there. But I would say like if if we know someone who we trust that has worked with that person, it's obviously not going to blow them up. But I trust in my network. Um, I sure as hell want to fi figure out some signal. References, you can easily give someone who's going to, you know, sing my praises. But if I can ring fence that at least to direct managers, people who that person's work for, at least I can help to make sure that I'm not getting stuck in there. And when I do that call, I'm not bullshitting it. Tell me if Harry's good or not. Hey, Harry's awesome. Cool. Thanks. Bye. What does Harry do well? What are the areas that you were coaching Harry in? 
what are the ways that others worked with them? You know, what are those things that actually get it out? And I set it up by saying, hey, I want to make sure this person's set up for success here, that we're the right fit for them so that we don't put them in the wrong type of company. So the more direct you'll be with me, the more open you'll be with me, the more we can figure out that for this human who I know you love and like and trust, that that's the best fit for them. Someone once gave me the best advice on referencing. They said people will 99% of the time never tell you their real weakness. So the way that you do it is you say, hey, if I was hiring someone to work alongside or beneath Rich, what skills would they have? And they go, oh, they'd be super rigorous. They'd be very operationally focused, not need to be so creative, but they'd be very much kind of uh, by the book and driven in numbers way operationally. And you're like, okay, you've just told me that Rich is not operational, but he's very creative. It's a really good one. Tell me, man, uh, we need to give these guys an offer and girls an offer now. How what's been some big lessons on comp comp packages for sales teams? How should I do it? Sometimes I hear founders say, "Oh, that person's like, you know, getting an offer from so and so, or they're competing with so and so. I got to compete with this," uh, and and to get over anchored into like throwing the kitchen sink and you know giving half the company to go get them. There are some good benchmarks out there for any role: AE, CSM, marketer, you know partnerships person, ops person, strategy person. So 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 trust that any all the VCs, all the talent folks and recruiter will give you give you that. The bigger question is also trying to figure out um is the person actually at that level of with that experience that you are comfortable making that offer to them. Right? I think a lot of the call it offer inflation out there that we had seen the last few years was like, okay, anybody can be a VP sales, CRO, CRO at a series A, whatever company and so the whole titling thing got sort of thrown out of whack because the inflation is out there. Um, another thing is like, okay, I do the job for a year. Does that make me a great COO? Does that make me a mark, you know, because I got the title now at one place at a company that may or may not be similar, similar scale, similar problems to solve? That doesn't necessarily qualify me for the job. So I would be really clear around like, let's make sure what you need in the job is like based on I need to solve this end of the journey. Build the first sales org, go from first to second line leadership, take us from early adopter to mainstream as we were doing at Navan when I joined. Um, these are the things I need done. Take us down market, take us up market, take us global, take us to... Okay, great. What scope of person do I need for that? And what is the right titling for that? And what is the, the comp for that? Um, be really clear about that and then make sure that the person you are hiring actually fits that description. Titles aside, experience aside, and that's what you want to use your interview process to go solve for. You know, we've had people who who I've I've hired. Hey, this is a let's call it strategic sales director or RVP role, and that person might have that title at another company. They might have that title or a bigger title, and they're saying, "No, I should be an SVP." Okay, great. You can go with them on that, or you could say, "Well, based on the work you're doing, based on the scope, as it translates to us, it's this role, this title," and it's okay to say, "Look." I recognize you can get that SVP, CRO, COO offer somewhere else. This is what this offer is. This is why I believe it's meaningful. The vision that we're selling, the 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 future that we're going to create, the opportunities you'll have to grow and learn, the opportunities to work with me, whatever those things are, to be really clear what they're getting there. But don't get caught into the like, I got to do this title or this offer just because somewhere else. And if you do, do so knowingly. I'm trading off that I'm giving this higher title to someone, to some some person that I might need to up level later because now I can't bring someone on top because I've given this title, I've given this cop, right? I think that's really important to keep in mind. And, and, and sometimes it's easy to say, okay, I just need to do this to get someone. And like, there you go. And, and I'm a huge proponent of being intellectually honest and, and bringing the people around you if you're a founder to help you do that, right? Your advisors who know go to market, your investors, um, the executive recruiters who again might have a bit of a conflict of interest in some ways, but 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 those people to help um, help you shape that. I want to talk about some of the art of sales though, which is a uh, quarter kind of doing it well. And I'm going to pepper you with questions. Number one, discounting. Do you do discounting? How do you advise founders on discounting? Depends on what is what is the model I'm trying to run. Right. Every every approach has trade offs. If I'm trying to do like it's a crowded race, it's a night fight. We got to capture share. I'm going to do the lowest that I can possibly maintain from a margin standpoint to capture that share and do it efficiently, then raise the prices. 
Is it a, hey, we think we built, even in a crowded space, the best product. It's at a premium. I can clearly tell a story that is defensible and differentiated when I get into that room with the CFO and tell them why it should be worth more. Um, those are pretty different approaches. If I'm, a lot of the founders I speak with, you know, will probably tell me, hey, we, we and Everlaw is the same way. We think we built the best product. We think we have the best team. We demonstrably get in the room and people say, yep, you guys are the best product. You've got built the best thing by far. Then it becomes a question of how much of a premium can I charge for it, right? And that, that premium depends on how well I can tell the story, quantify the value, uh, have proven results for delivery. And so from that standpoint... Rich, let me ask you a very direct question. Yeah. Do, do you discount? <laughs> yes. If I'm running a PLG, like... Don't waste your time getting into these cycles of like discounting and not. But if I'm running like an enterprise sale, I like to hold a high list and then figure out how I need to discount to still protect a premium and get the deal done. I'm going to discount aggressively if I need to break into new space and market, but I need to know why I'm doing that and the trade-off I'm getting because now I'm eating CAC effectively, right? It's feed my cat deal reviews how often do you do them what makes a good deal review versus a bad one how do you structure them yeah um yes we do them bad deal review is everybody get in a room let's go talk about the deal see what happened right great deal review um you know, my my uh, my successor at the vine carlos is i think who you've met also uh has like this nice little simple Netflix template that i stole from him thank you carlos uh which is uh literally like all right let's actually go through and and see use a framework any framework med pick you build your own right command of the message like you know what's the pain what's the negative consequences what are the outcomes you want what are the the after scenario and positive business outcome use a framework but be religious about actually using it so that you're not just getting in there all right what's going on with the deal you know and it's sometimes uh doing that for all the key deals that are not necessarily just going to close in a quarter but that you need to go evolve from whether it's 10 or 25% stage to the 50, 90% stage, that's actually where the impact is driven. Like when we're looking at the deals that are supposed to close this quarter, it's like, all right, you have a close plan, do you have access to the EB, have you quantified the metrics, have you done the validation steps? It's actually that cohort of deals that's like going from whatever you call it, that we've done the demo, there's something here, we haven't actually built it into like a verbal commit yet. That's actually where the deal review is the most valuable. And I'm trying to grab those deals every quarter and make sure that either me or head of sales or head of America's, whoever it is, is actually doing that deal review with that set of deals every quarter. You get through them. Rich, how time. often do you do deal reviews? Weekly, at least. Okay, weekly at least. Got you. Who comes to the deal review? The rep, frontline manager, and an executive, the other VP sales, the, the SVP sales, me, someone should be there. What are the most common reasons that you don't get deals over the line? I think there's a few places that comes up. Number one is you never had true buy-in at the to, to start with. You didn't do the deal the right way, yet you're trying to prosecute and just go through the sales stages. I'll send out contracts, you know, boss, I got 10 contracts out. All right, are any of them going to sign? Right, by when, by what? Actually trying to do the contracting and the like, operational sale without actually getting over the hump with your champion, with your economic buyer, with a business case that matters. Um, that's a huge issue, particularly right now in a changing market. Um, uh, a second one is not getting to the economic buyer and actually selling to them. Right now, the, oh, I got, you know, I got the EB in back behind the scenes. That's not a true champion. You don't have a deal. Those are probably the things that are hurting deals the most right now in this current environment, in this changing. I totally agree with you there. What are the biggest red flags in the first month of a new sales rep joining? What are the signs that eesh, they may not be right? They don't do PG, number one. They don't generate their own pipeline. They won't make the calls. They won't actually get out there and get so their P hands dirty. PG is pipeline generation? Correct. Okay. If they're not doing, If they're not doing it, early in their tenure, that's a sign. If you've set up an expectation that they should be doing it, to me, that's a big one. And how do you tell that? Do you look in pipe drive and see? Do you look in their calendars and see their email? Yeah. So so I'm, I'm looking at, so there's as tactical as activity, but if we could set up basic Salesforce reporting on how many you know, ops they're generating, how a good rule of thumb is like an AE in my book should be generating at least a new op a week by themselves without SDRs, without marketing, helping them in an enterprise software sale, outbound sale. 
are you at least doing one off a week? If you're not, okay, are you doing activity? How are you doing it? Do you actually know how to do it? That's the hardest part of selling. If they don't have either the appetite or the skill to do that, you better get it fast because you're not going to work here. And granted, we should be vetting for that in our hiring process, going back to what we just talked about. That's number one. Number two is when they just don't seem to grok the product. Like if I don't, if I can't grok the like talk track, how to talk about it, how to, how to use the product, how to share it. Yes. And we talked about not going straight to a product led sale, a driven sale. But if they're not showing that at a pretty fundamental level and quickly grappling, on, grappling onto those sound bites, talk tracks, um, that's usually a big red flag for me. So between those two, those are pretty early because those are the precursors to, can you actually get pipe? Can you actually build late stage pipe? Can you actually do deals? It doesn't matter how good they were in the, um, in the, in the room because they might not ever get there. What are the biggest fuck ups you've made as a sales leader, Rich? Oh my God, there's so many. Where do I start? Um, this is one where probably good advice for founders and for, for sales leaders and heads of sales are just getting really aligned on expectations and what's possible, what's not. Right. So number one is like, I talk to a lot of early stage go to market leaders and early stage founders who will tell me the flip side of this same question, which is like, what's possible? You know, I want to push my, he's talking to a founder and he had just churned out a head of sales. I want to push them hard. I want to like make sure that, you know, we're striving and we're, you know, this is like a 10 X type of year. We should be around five X this year. I believe the product is so good that it should be doing that. His sales leader didn't have that belief. His sales leader is like, Hey, I think this is like a two X year, one and a half X year, 50% growth year. Here's why. And there was that gap between what was, po- what, what each side thought was possible. And instead of like solving that and figuring out a target, Set, the CEO sets founder sets a target that's like crazy high. Sales leader is like, you know, I don't have the confidence to push back or like, like bring this to a head or leave and takes that. And then you just sort of, you know, we'll bend over backwards, try to make it happen, see what happens. And then, you know, even if you get to 90% of that crazy stretch target, man, it feels like, oh, we burnt, run ourselves ragging. We still didn't hit it. You know, maybe the board's like, ah, oh, how come you didn't hit this target? And meanwhile, Growing 4x on a 5x target might have been freaking amazing in the like just taking all the weird expectations out of it. I've certainly fallen into that camp. That's one of the biggest things that I've done as a sales leader. Uh, so I think it's just so important to get no daylight between what we think is possible, what the appropriate amount of stretches, so that we set the expectations around the right way. We motivate the team the right way. They have the right feelings of winning. We set the board expectations and company expectations the right way. And most importantly, in this environment, we're investing the right way as the worst thing is I invest for like a two X growth year and I grow, you know, one of half X and I took the cost to grow two X and it grew. What, what would you advise sales leaders in terms of accurate forecasting in 2023? What yeah. will be a hard year? Yeah. Um, now is the time more than ever to go inspect what is real and what is not. Because things that might have been a deal that you could feel 50%, 75%, 90% confident in a year ago might not close at all this year or might get delayed this year. So like the difference between deals pushing, deals not closing at all, or deals coming in way smaller is, in my opinion, do I have direct access to an EB? Do I have a real business case or am I selling it off of a cool, you know, this is a nice product we'd love to have. Um... If I'm doing that kind of inspection for true business case, direct access to EB, you know, do I have a closed plan in front of them or an evaluation plan that we've talked about? By this date, we will do this. By this date, we will do that. You are looking for these three things to go make a decision. These are who the people are who are going to make the decision by this date. And this is what we will show them. If we don't have that, even if it was a good deal last year, it's probably not going to close this year and it's definitely not going to close on time. Like So that level of inspection of your mid-stage pipe and, and what are the things in your sale you need to have a deal right now and take a fresh look at it? That is what I think everyone should be doing in your entire sort of mid-stage pipe and building into your early qualification deal process or sales process um, if you don't have it. And again, it could, those are the things I'm seeing like in different sales, in different industries, in different velocities, it could be different things. But that's, um, that's the thing that's going to keep us from getting surprised around, hey, I had this pipe and I had this, thought I had this great pipe coverage. It turned out it was like fake pipe. And uh, just slipped out or fell out. I can talk to you all day, my friend, but I want to move into a quick fire round, which is 
very much similar to what we've been doing, but essentially I'll be a little bit more disciplined on the timing. So we're going to start with what sales tactic have not changed over the last five years? Um, what sales tactic has not changed over the last five years? I would say I'm a huge fan of force management um, and that the value framework, you know, whether it's force management, whether it's like challenger selling, that idea of needing to attach like do enough pain-based discovery to figure out what are the most important problems or worries or fears or existential threats that that company is facing, that the CEO is facing, that the economic buyer in your org is facing. Like doing that level of pain-based discovery has not changed. Um, and actually getting to that true, I don't know, Sandler called like level three pain of like, what is the true business pain and figuring out how to map what you do, your service, your platform, really back directly to that in a quantifiable way, that has not changed. What sales, not tactic, changed what what sales tactic has died a death? I would say for, for me right now, um, having that perfectly crafted email of like, hey, I'm I dead. did a great UI now, it's two paragraphs, I've done a lot of research, or I've done the cheap thing where it's like, hey, you went to Yale, you're the captain of the volleyball team. What do you think about Yale volleyball this year, Rich? Like those types of like, pure write the perfect email and you get a you get a response like that's not going to work right now um i would say like multi-touch and if you're an sdr ae like multi-touch i don't get a lot of calls i won't take a lot of calls um but i will say like send me the text send me the send me the leave the call send me the text hit me on the voicemail send me the video video like hit me in all the ways hit me on linkedin if you're trying to figure out how to get through to someone I think needing to actually be creative and multi-touch. I'm always shocked at how many reps don't do the quick video or don't do the LinkedIn or don't do the Twitter or don't do the G-chat. Uh, well, what is the biggest it. mistake founders make when hiring sales teams? Um, the biggest mistake I think is is hiring ahead of what you actually have conviction to do. You think you are ready to scale and, and, and you're not ready to drive efficient scale. The second is just hiring a leader that is, is, is not really well suited to what you need done in terms of what you need to accomplish in the next 12 to 18 months, not 24 to 36, and not moving quickly enough to go make changes if it's not working. What one piece of advice would you give to a sales leader starting a new role today? Be quick in identifying and driving alignment with the CEO or founder uh, or your boss. Like, What are the most important things we can get done this quarter? Uh, and what are the two, one or two metrics that I need to show you to show that we're doing this right? What would you most like to change about the world of sales? I would love to see more people get into it instead of feeling like, you know, when I got into sales, I was a, I was a, a gangly engineering student from Yale. And, and I had this understanding that it was for like, you know, slick, well-spoken um, white guys that could tell the story the right way. And I sort of had that chip on my shoulder. Um, and I would say that I would love to see more people consider it as a career coming out of any major with any background um, uh, because it's an amazing career. I've learned a ton. I've met some really cool people doing it. And the reason I'm still doing it is because I keep learning and I keep figuring out ways um, to do it differently. And in an environment where maybe AI is going to take our jobs, the ability to go connect with people in a real way, the ability to go show value, the ability to go do deep discovery. Um, I think that's at a premium. And sometimes slick, well-spoken white guys aren't very good at <laughs> I was, I was I like, listening to that description going, going, oh, I feel judged. Ah, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean by one of my best friends are, are, uh, are, are that. I don't really know. Do you know why? My ego is sufficiently inflated anyway. I will be fine. <laughs> uh, but I do want to finish on my favorite, actually, which is other than, you know, Avalor, what one company sales strategy have you been most impressed by recently? Oh, gosh. Hmm. It was a while back, but I, I think one of the plays that I think really helped me even during the pandemic. So we, we bought people AI during the pandemic at Trip Actions Nevada. And it was initially to go get like contact capture so we can build our, 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 our database to go um, track activity and go um, go better do marketing to those folks. And they sort of did this thing where they did the like, hey, we know you don't want to buy this expensive analytics offering. But we think it can give you some insights. And I'm like, no, no, no I got a great analytics team. CKC is the best on the planet. You know, real hold the size, like amazing. Like we got our own stack. We're good. And and they were like, well, just 
you know, we'll give it to you for free for six months. Just try it out. Like we'll help you implement it and stand it up. And if it's anything other than amazing, like you don't have to pay for it, but they built it into the contract. So it was like premium and an enterprise software sale. They sort of built a freemium thing into the contract. They worked with us to stand it up and make it successful. And sure enough, we signed, you know, we signed the check to do the, the broader sort of broader platform buy after that was done, despite a lot of skepticism on my part that it was valuable. Now that's not to say, you know, that's the the only way to do it. But in a world where we're trying to drive more bundle size and basket within our customers right now um, to keep them sticky in an environment that is going to be more friction around buying and keeping pieces of har- hardware or software, thinking creatively around how to actually build that expansion, that cross-sell into your sale up front. I think that was a great example that, um, that we had. And you got a travel company to buy more software during a pandemic when the revenue went down to zero, I think is a pretty cool feat. Dude, I love this. Thank you so much for putting up. It's Friday afternoon, so I've been more casual than I normally am in my straight, you know, land English box. Uh, but I've loved this. It's been so much fun. You've been fantastic. So thank you so much for joining me today, man. Oh my gosh, Harry. M- much enjoyed on my side. Um, always a pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. You are.